Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 167. Now this was going to be the third part of my interview with Sandy Peterson, but I've decided to put that on hold for a week so I could bring you this information from Mr. Josh Sawyer. Josh is one of the developers working on the Project Eternity Kickstarter, and I know you guys are going to want to hear all about this. Plus, there's only 10 days left on the Kickstarter, so there's not much time left if you want to make a pledge and secure some of the goodies available there. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Josh Sawyer. All right, folks, I am here with the great Josh Sawyer. He's the project director at Obsidian, a company you've probably heard of if you like computer role-playing games. He's part of the team that brought us Fallout New Vegas, Icewind Dale 2. Now he's working on this really exciting project called Project Eternity. How are you today, Josh? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Now, Josh, it seems to me we're living in some very interesting times right now. You're working with Chris Avalon and uh, Tim Kaine, two of my favorite uh, game designers. I've had them on, on the show before. Uh, working on this thing called Project Eternity. And I was reading uh, the idea here is to pay homage homage to uh, Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, Planescape Torment, which are three of my favorite games of all time. Uh, so it's funded by a Kickstarter, and it's absolutely spectacular the results you've gotten with this. I mean, $2.2 million. I just want to know, uh, Josh, what is it like to be in your shoes right now? Well, it's um, it's pretty surprising to see people responding as, as uh, enthusiastically as they have. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to make sure that we put out a good game, obviously. Um, I think the difference here is because a lot of the backers are, you know, they know about the game right away. They have a ton of questions, and we don't always have all the answers for them yet because we're very, very early in the project. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure, but um, thankfully people have been very supportive of us and uh, it's going great. Now, why did you have to take this to a Kickstarter project? I mean, there, there weren't publishers interested in this project? No, I don't think so. Um, to be honest, especially when it comes to a game with full party control, and an isometric perspective, I think most publishers are really focused on having as broad a platform coverage as they can get. So to me, these sort of this style of game really demands uh, mouse and keyboard input. And on a console, that would be really hard uh, to do. And, uh, and so I think that it's sort of dead in the water. Like as soon as you bring up this sort of a style of game, it's just not the view isn't what they sort of think of or the control style isn't something that really works on the console. So it's not something we're thinking of for console. Uh, so yeah, those, those sort of conversations usually didn't go very far. Well, that was one of the selling points of the game from the Kickstarter page. And I read one of your blog posts about this, which, which by the way, Josh, I love your blog. Uh, but there's a, a post about dialogues and the deep dialogues that the, that the game is going to have, the mature themes, the really difficult choices. So I'm just, uh, you know, usually, to be honest, a lot of the games I play with dialogue, I, I just want to skip through it as soon as possible and get to the, to the game. Uh, so what's going to be different about Project Eternity? In terms of the dialogue or just the game in general? In terms of the dialogue, I mean, what are you going to do to make me want to read this stuff? Well, um, it's sort of hard to put into a concise uh, little package, but I think that over time, as we've made a lot of these games, we found that it's not necessarily that players don't want to read. Um, I think designing dialogue for people that inherently don't want to read is a bad thing. But at the same time, we have to be good editors. We have to make conversations that are interesting to the player from more than just a lore perspective, meaning characters have motivations and, and problems that they need resolved, and their conversations are about topics. They're not walking encyclopedias, which isn't to say that you can't learn narrative information from a character, but using them for exposition dumps, I think is usually where we lose people. Um, and if you can find ways, this doesn't always work, when you can find ways to tie in uh, information about the world and lore with the central plot, the character, um, your character, those things are all ways where the player has a number of reasons why they would want to pay attention. Um, I think when you start sort of making it more abstract and vague or, or purely information-based, um, it sort of starts to question, like, well, why am I in, a, I in a conversation right now looking at this? Why is this not in a book or a manual? Um, so I think making the characters feel like they have issues and the reason why they're talking to you is because they want to talk about those things and figure out how to solve a problem. 
Because that's what you're doing when you're playing a game is you're figuring out how you want to solve a problem. And in a role-playing game, it's about your choice and how you want to do it. So the more interested you make the player in having that agency and realizing that they control the course of how not just the conversation goes, but the quests go and how the whole plot goes, I think you can sort of push characters towards being more interested inherently uh, in, in conversations and the plot in general. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I already want to see what, you, what you're going to come up with. Kind of wondering, what is it wor uh, like uh, working with Tim and Chris on this? Well, it's great because, um, you know, Tim obviously has a huge amount of experience. I mean, I've been in the industry about 13 years. Tim got started, he said, about 30 years ago. So he's been doing this twice as long as I have. Um, Chris focuses really heavily on character development and writing. And obviously he worked on, I mean, he was like the lead designer on Torment. So when we're talking about all the things that we want to do, I think we get a, a really nice mix of approaches. I approach things very practically from a mechanical standpoint. Um, Tim uh, really you know, has a lot of experience working with different mechanics. He also worked on Temple of Elemental Evil, which was... It's nice to contrast Tim's experiences with my own because I had so many experiences working with a real-time with pause D&D system, and he worked with a pure, you know, true-to-form uh, turn-based system. So talking about the pros and cons of those systems and ways to work around them is very fun. Uh, also talking to Avalon and, and hearing his ideas about how he would want to approach certain topics in a fantasy setting that's ours to make without the restriction of, of a licensor, that's a lot of fun because we don't have to sort of say, well... You know, is the licensor going to complain if we show this character in a negative light or if we talk about drugs or things like that? that that's not really an issue for us. I was looking at the Kickstarter goal. It's my understanding you originally just wanted a million dollars, right? And then it uh, ended up with two million and got all these uh, stretch goals set up. I'm wondering, do you guys worry at all about these stretch goals and uh, worry that you might be uh, promising too much? Well, I mean, we yeah, we do worry about it, but we worry about it before we put them up. <laughs> right. So we, you know, whenever we whenever we start talking about stretch goals, um, the question that usually more than one of us will ask is, are we confident that this feature actually is ballpark? Because the thing is, it, it's not really it's not really accurate to look at our stretch goals as as, as a budget because it's not like well, crafting is going to cost you know one hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we're not, um, you know, over committing like, well, can you actually do this feature for just a hundred thousand dollars or does it actually require two, um, or should we split these features up so that they can actually be spread over multiple stretch goals? So we are concerned about it. Um, but at the same time, like we want to make a big game. We want to make a game that not only, you know, I think the tricky thing is that we don't only have to deal with the expectations of what the Infinity Engines were, but we also have to deal with the expectations of the games that have come out since then. So, for example, we put up a stretch goal for crafting, and some people said, well, I just figured there would be crafting in this game, but there wasn't really crafting in any of the Infinity Engine games. So not only do people want, well, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people want not only what's in the Infinity Engine games, but they want a lot of the features that came in subsequent games. So... By having those stretch goals, we can uh, find ways to expand, you know, that list of things that we can do. And we, we try to be pretty level-headed about it. Well, you're obviously doing something right uh, with this Kickstarter project. I mean, this is amazing to me. I just, you know, I've uh, been working with some other developers that are trying to do their own Kickstarter projects, and they haven't had the level of uh, success uh, that you've had. So I'm just wondering, do you have a, a secret formula? Or, or what do you think it is about your project that's got so many people excited about the Kickstarter? I think it's nostalgia, really. I think, I mean, I'll admit our, our pitch was very high level because we wanted to sort of take our time in fleshing out the mechanics in the world. And so we, we really, a lot of that campaign is on very, a very high level idea, which is, did you like the Infinity Engine games? Well, we all worked on those games and we worked on a lot of them, not necessarily all of them. And Tim worked on not the Infinity Engine games, but he worked on some of the most beloved role playing games of the past, you know, 10, 15 years. So, you know, it's really saying like, hey, we really like this style of game. If you really like that style of game, we want to make something that is set in our own world um, without the restrictions that, you know, we might have placed on us by a publisher or by a licensor. So if you dig that, then back us. And it's very high level, which, again, can be frustrating for some backers because they, they want to know what they're backing, which is understandable. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that 
that high level idea makes people very enthusiastic and, and the nostalgia I think is driving a lot of that. Yeah, I just can't thank you enough, Josh, for being part of it. <laughs> I love this, but I can't wait to play it. Anyway, I got a question here from RPG Codex. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Are you familiar with that, with those guys? Yeah. Uh, so here's the question. Uh, what are your thoughts on cooldowns versus mana pool versus, I believe this is Vancean magic? Yeah. It's apparently a hot topic on the Eternity forums right now. Yeah, so Vancean magic, for people that don't um, aren't familiar with that term, they're probably familiar with what it actually is, but not necessarily that term. Jack Vance, and I think it was the Dying Earth uh, series, um, the wizards in that setting would literally, they would memorize a spell, and when they cast that spell, the words of it would just be burned out of their memory. So uh, Dungeons and Dragons spell casting, before 3rd edition at least, and before Sorcerers, was sort of a Vancean system where you would prepare your spells, uh, memorize them, including multiple uses of the same spell, and then you would cast them and then they were gone. So uh, it's come up because, uh, you know, people ask my opinions on cooldowns, and cooldowns are just, they're a mechanic. Like, they're a thing, and they can be used with a lot of other things. And uh, I don't think that cooldowns are inherently really great or inherently really bad. They're just a, a balancing tool. So the way that we're actually looking at um, wizards specifically for the setting is that uh, we want them to learn spells. We want them to have a spell book or actually a series of spell books that exceeds their capability to cast at any given time. But we don't, we're not strictly using a, a Vancey and you must go rest and rememorize a spell to get it back. So cooldowns, the only, <clears throat> the only thing we've talked about for wizards with regards to cooldowns is the idea that cooldowns can be used as a means of um, essentially locking off uh, blocks of spells once you've exhausted it for a level. So, for example, you have a you know mid-level mage <clears throat> who's casting, you know, uh, I can cast four third-level spells, just like a, a you know like an tenth or, or actually like an eleventh-level wizard in D and D could cast. I think fourth-level spells, not counting for bonus spells, but anyway. Um, so goes to cast them and cast, and and the spells that are currently available in the selected spell books are. Fireball, lightning bolt, haste, and slow, let's just say. So the wizard goes in, casts fireball. Mm, that didn't do it. Another fireball. Oh, crap. I need to speed my party up. Haste. Great. Uh, no, one more fireball. Great. Cast it. So was able to, in sequence, cast those. They didn't have a cooldown in the sense that they were locked out from using that spell again. But once they've cast four of those third-level spells, the third-level spell bank is locked out for a period of time that is likely to last the rest of the combat, maybe most of the rest of the combat. So it's effectively accomplished the same thing you would as if you had exhausted it in a normal D&D game. The difference is that because the cooldown is not incredibly long, after the fight or between fights, that's going to come back on. So essentially you don't have to literally go find a camp and rest. Um, and so the cooldown is really just used as a means of um, locking you out for a tactical purpose. So like, yeah, you, you blew all your third level spells. You can't use that anymore. Um, the only other uh, way we've talked about using cooldowns is we like the idea of a player preparing different spell books. So you have your spells that you know, and at any given time you can cast spells from your spell book and that's up to your limit. So you may actually know 20 third level spells. You're crazy. You got all these different spells in your current spell book. Maybe you can only have four in one book at a time. So if you come up against a tactical threat where you suddenly realize you're not particularly well equipped to deal with it, you have the option of either sticking with your current set and sort of adapting, or if you're willing to take a lockout cooldown, basically saying, like, you can't cast any of your major spells for the next, like, let's say 30 seconds, you can swap your spell book out. So when the spell book is being swapped out, you might be able to use um, very low power or like your sort of, you know, like standard attacks or things like that. Uh, but you're not going to be casting like finger of death or anything like that because that's all in your spell book. So from that point, it becomes a very, it's pretty, there's a pretty big disincentive to not try to switch that book in the middle of a fight. However, if you get in that fight and you realize, whoa, this area is full of fire salamanders and I have a book full of fire spells, this is not good. If you swap that book out, 
you can probably just keep moving immediately because it's only going to be 30 seconds before you have. And I'm using 30 seconds as a general term. It's not literally going to be 30 seconds. I don't know what it's actually going to be. But that, that means that buffering allows um, there to be a tactical consequence, but it doesn't strictly say you must go rest to get those new spells back. So that's all we've talked about, but that could change. Our goal is really to give the feeling of tactical, strategic and tactical considerations that go into playing uh, a wizard in third edition or second edition, uh, but without the very strict level of you have to go rest for eight hours to get those spells back or to change those spells. That sounds great. Well, uh, just one last question about this uh, project. Does it have rats in it? <laughs> I don't know yet. This is a new world. Maybe this is a world without rats. Oh, we'll no. <laughs> <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the third part of my interview with Sandy Peterson, so stay tuned for that. It's going to tell us all about his time at id. Really good stuff, so stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show. After you've made your pledge uh, to Project Eternity, uh, please head over to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link, and support the show. I really appreciate it, guys. You're keeping these shows and interviews coming. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now what about that Ale of the Week? So for the Ale this week, I have a really interesting one. Uh, this is the Imperial Iniquity Black Ale. This is brewed in uh, by the uh, Southern Tier Brewing Company out of uh, Lakewood, New York. And apparently it's all about this little symbol here, the six-pointed star, which is actually a hexagram talisman, which has been used around the world for centuries to invoke magic and good luck. Now, there's a, quite a bit of text on the bottle, kind of interesting stuff here. Uh, they say they call it iniquity because uh, this beer is contrary to what one may expect from an IPA. This is an ale as black as night. It is the antithesis of unearthly. It also has 9% alcohol by volume, so let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this iniquity here in the old drinking gourd. I've been smelling this. It smells really nice, kind of coffee, chocolatey kind of thing going on there. Just a really good smell. Let's give it a taste. That's really strong. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, what am I tasting there? Uh, definitely some coffee, some kind of cherry, uh, a little chocolatey. Something else I can't quite identify. It's really tasty. There is, it is kind of sweet. Uh, the sort of cherry flavor is uh, uh, quite strong. It's quite good, actually. Nice, uh, thick, strong black ale. Uh, not really very, well, there's a little bitterness, but not much. The aftertaste, there's a little bitterness there, but nothing that you probably can't handle or won't like. I really enjoy this one. I'm going to give it a, a four out of five drinking horns. I uh, highly recommend this. Uh, quite tasty, and I think you'll enjoy it. So look for Iniquity Black Ale. Let's uh, wrap up with a quotation. And uh, this quotation is from one of my favorite comedians, Mr. Groucho Marx. It goes something like this. The secret of life is honesty and fair dealing. If you can fake that, you've got it made. See you guys next week. My mental capacity is infinitely greater. Modest, isn't he? Modesty would be dishonesty. What's wrong with being dishonest? Is that a question? Yes. The question is futile.